Um, welcome to a later version of Talking MMT, where I basically read out uh, different uh, literature, uh, pretty much uh, spelling out what a monetary theory is, other things, and sometimes I read those that are critical of uh, monetary theory and uh, at least trying to embark on so far where I've learned from uh, reading and studying and talking with others on social media about my monetary theory and uh, the foundation and the lens of which it allows other people who don't know much about economic um, uh, policies uh, to focus through that lens and figure it out as far as the part goes and know uh, what you should not uh, basically be concerned with as far as headline news that's called. Anyway, uh, this is by L. Randall Wright, and this is called The Alternative Paths to MMT. This is from January of last year, January 2020, to be precise. And apparently this is from a, uh, it's a recap of uh, uh, from his talk at ICAP. Uh, which I'm not really sure what that means, but maybe I'll get to it in the, the, the whole thing. Anyway, so first I'll clearly state what MMT is and then outline four paths that lead to NFT's conclusions by L. Randall Ray. Logic, history, theory, and practice. What is MMT? It provides an analyst of, uh, analysis excuse me, of fiscal and monetary policy that is applicable to national governments with sovereign currencies. There are four requirements identified as sovereign currency the national government chooses a money of account. B, imposes obligations, i.e. taxes, fees, fines, tribute, uh, and uh, tithes, and the money of account. C, issues a currency denominated in the money of account and accepts that, accepts that currency in payment, and D, if the national government issues all obligations, these are also payable to national currencies, own currency, and the government's their own currency. As a fifth consideration that follows from these, if a country takes, adopts a gold standard or dollarizes it, doesn't really have a sovereign currency because it is committed to delivering that to which it takes. That can reduce policy space uh, unless if it accumulates enough of the foreign reserve. Uh, what differences does sovereign currency make? We argued that the sovereign currency issuer does not face a budget constraint as conventionally defined. Two, cannot run out of money. Three, can always meet its obligation by paying in its own currency. And four, can set the interest rate up on any obligation, obligations and issues. Now that, uh, now, uh, now what do our critics accuse us of? Let's look at the top claims. Because we say a sovereign currency cannot run out of money, they claim we advocate for government spend without limit, as if the goal of MT is to cause sovereign inflation. Because we see a sovereign currency, sovereign can, because we say a sovereign can always meet obligations as they come to credits claim, we say that deficits don't matter. Because we see that government spends by key stroking credits to bank reserves. Critics claim we advocate forcing the Fed to print up money to pay for all government spending. What we actually say is that current procedures adopted by the Treasury, the central bank, and private banks allow government to spend up to the budget approved by Congress is signed by the President. No change procedure is required. We emphasize that sovereign governments face resource restraints, not financial restraints. We've always argued that too much spending, whether it be government or sorry, whether it be by government or by private sector, can cause inflation. Finally, a favorite criticism adopted by our uh, heterodox uh, frenemies is that MMP doesn't apply to many countries, such as Somalia, the Central African Republic, the Congo. Uh, Liberia, Zimbabwe, uh, Malawi, uh, Mozambique, uh, Mozambique, Ecuador, Greece, Honduras. Because it does not apply to them, MMT is the American first fascist policy. 
what do all these countries have in common? They do not issue a sovereign currency. We have always made it clear what we mean by a sovereign currency. NMT regular, rigorously applies to sovereign currencies that may be the minority in terms of numbers, but they probably account for three fourths of global GDP. That doesn't mean that uh, NMT scholars have ignored countries without sovereign currencies. I recommend especially the work of Bill Mitchell and Fidel Kabul. But our main focus has been on sovereign currency. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to go into the case of developing nations now. I'm uh, I'm going to move on to forecast to NMT. We usually begin our explicit uh, expectation with logic based on the assumption that econ uh, economists are good at logic. One would think so. With all their models and math at deducting the same thing. However, uh, with about 35 years of working in, econ in economics, 25 of those working on NMT, I have concluded that economists are terrible at logic. So let's begin with history. But history about economic uh, economists uh, are not better, um, are not much better at history than they are logic. So let's try a recently simple and clear example, one provided by Farley Grubb, the expert at on American colonial currency. The American colonial government were always short of uh, British coins, but prohibited by the crown from coining their own. So they so they each came up with their own money of account. For example, the Virginia pound imposed taxes in that money of account, issued paper notes in the money of account, spent the paper notes, collected those notes and taxes, and then burned down our tax revenue. I told you, it would be simple and clear. A one cent fishery of sovereign currency in colonial America. If you want more details, read Grub. I like several. Uh, I like several things about this example. First, it is clear that the colony, colonies spent the notes first, then collected them in taxes. They could not possibly have collected paper notes in taxes if they had not first spent them because they were there were not no other paper monies around. Second, the, uh, the colonies did not spend the tax revenue received in the form of paper notes. They burned the notes of all of them. Tax laws they were called redemption taxes with the expressed purpose of redeeming the notes, removing them from circulation to be burned. Finally, the spending was self financing. Our argument is that this is the way it worked, with, it has worked for the past 4,000 years at least. As Keynes put it, that, that is modern money, that is modern money, money, <laughs> modern money period to which NFT applies. Two, logic. Again, let's keep this simple. Warren Moser provides the following example. He wanted his kids to watch his car. To motivate them, he offered to pay them using his own business cards. But dad, why would you want to use your cards? They are worthless. Well, he answered, I'm opposing a tax on five business cards day to day if you want access to food, clothing, and shelter. But how can we get these cards? I'll pay, I'll pay five business cards for watching the car. Note, all the logic we learned from the history of foreign oil currency applies. Warren has to spend first for collecting the cards. No one can pay the taxes until Warren spends, and redemption of the cards as taxes removes them from circulation. The car gets washed and the kids get fed. Taxes drive money, and money mobilizes resources such as labor for car washing. In a nutshell, that's our monetary system. In modern economies, uh, there's a couple of degrees of separation between taxpayers and the treasury. I'll come back to that. Uh, number three, theory. MT adopts the NAP Keynes Keynes and State Money Theory outline in the treaties. The Marx Keynes Bevelin MTP and its theory of effective uh, demand developed in the general theory. Schumpeter's uh, E4 theory of uh, banking development of America, Franco and Italian circuit approach, uh, Lipke's uh, theory of profits and godly section sectoral uh, sectoral balance approach. Together, these provide a coherent stock flow consistent and heterodox theory of the role of money in the economy. 
that stands in stark contrast to the neoclassical multiple funds and ISL and approaches that are fundamentally irredeemable and inco irredeemably incoherent. Indigenous money approaches our approach consists of loans make deposits, deposits make reserves. Banks can never run out of money since they create it when they make loans and central banks, central banks can never run out of reserves since they lend them into existence. So far and so good. I think every heterodox economist as well as most central bankers are now on board with this. Big money and central money, uh, big, uh, central bank money are not scarce resources. We can have as much as we want, and we generally have more than is good uh, than is good for us as Wall Street bankers run wild. Par uh, paradoxically, most uh, heterodox and orthodox economists believe that the foreign government itself faces a critical money shortage. Bankers cannot run out. The sovereign government's central bank cannot run out. The government faces a strict budget constraint, exceeding it leads to disaster. Attacked by bond vigilantes, insolvency, bankruptcy, uh, and hyperinflation. hyperinflation. The largest and most powerful economic, econ economic entity the world has ever seen, the U.S. federal government must get its fiscal house in order. It relies too much on lending by Chinese any day now. The supply of dollar dollars to over 20 percent will cut uh, will cut be cut off. Okay, will, be, will cut be cut off. A rub from the dollar will reduce its international purchase power to peanuts. Our prolegate, uh, prolegate government is leading hundreds of trillions of dollars of debt to our grandkids. If I say that, the heterodox approach insists on injections are casually prior to leakages, you all recognize that from fundamental Keynesian theory. And if I say that government spending is an injection and taxes are leakages, everyone understands. When I say that government spending is logical prior to taxes, paradox economists only get out all data of the future. If I say uh, if I say government has to spend first before taxes can get paid, I'm called crazy. Government spending cannot be financed at taxes and must um, sorry, uh, it must proceed to taxes. It is one of the injections that creates income that can be used to finance leakages such as saving and taxes. So uh, so government spending uh, cannot be financed out of savings. Either government spending must create the income that can be saved in the form of purchases, purchased government bonds. This is all just basically macroeconomics. While an individual can pay taxes or buy bonds, out of her savings. This is not a possible this is not possible at the average level. Our heterodox frenemies all flunk first year macro theory. It is the government's deficit that is the, the normal injection that allows our domestic private sector to net save and as well as well as well allows the rest of the world to net uh, net save dollars. Neither domestic saving uh, nor foreign saving can be can be a source of finance for U.S. government savings. Our spending. The U.S. government spends only dollars in the form of reserves issued by the Fed and credited to, bank, to private bank accounts at the Fed. Tax receipts are all, almost solely received in the form of Fed reserves debited from bank private bank accounts uh, all, uh, held at the Fed. To the extent they, that foreign central banks hold dollars, they came from the U.S. and are held in the form of reserve deposits of the Fed, U.S. Treasuries, or, or Fed notes. The U.S. government must supply dollars of reserve before it can receive them, just as banks mu must supply deposits before they can receive them in payment. The practice. I'm going to be, I'm going to be brief. On institutional practice, this is something NFT has focused on since the very beginning. Before we documented how the government really spends, no academic economist had any idea. Now it drives our, our critics crazy, and they can't claim they can complain that every time they criticize NFT, we go so deeply into the accounting details that it blows a challenging mind. 
In the old days, governments just notched tally sticks, minted coins, and or printed paper money. When they spent, then collected them in the redemption charts, and then burned or melted them. Today, all modern governments use central banks to make and receive all payments. That's one degree of separation. Central banks make and receive all payments through private banks. That's the second degree of separation. Two degrees of separation is so complicated that critics throw up, uh, throw up their hands in, in, in desperation when we insist that nothing significant has changed. Oh, it is all just too complicated. Government spending is still financed by money creation and taxes destroy money in the form of central bank reserves. Uh, yeah. uh, instead of wooden sticks, we use electronic keystrokes. Government cannot run out. The central bank will not say no. For it, from its perspective, it never violates the prohibition, uh, prohibition against lending to the treasury. It simply ensures that the payments, and system, the payments system functions smoothly. Furthermore, government never needs to borrow its own currency. Bond sales by, by sovereign government are not really a not really a borrowing operation. Rather, they offer a higher interest earned substitute for central bank reserves. This was Warren Moser's key contribution, recognizing recognized before there was an MMP. And it made him rich because he concluded that credit ratings agencies had no idea what they were doing when they downgraded sovereign government debt. Government can make all payments as they come due. Bonds, the junkies cannot force default while their portfolio for purposes could affect interest rates and exchange rates. The central bank's interest rate target is the most important de uh, determinant of interest rates on the entire structure of bond rates. Exchange rates are more flexible, uh, complexly determined, but change interest rate uh, parity. Their um, uh, provides a guide. The Fed is a creature of uh, is, is a creature of Congress. The Congress can seek control of the interest rate at any time it wants. And in any and in any event, bond eventualities cannot hold the nation's ho nation hostage. The central bank can always overrule them. In truth, the only bond vigilante we face is the Fed. And in recent years, it has demonstrated a firm commitment to keep rates low. Finally, even if the Fed abandons low rates, the Treasury can afford to make all payments on debt as they come due, no matter how high the Fed pushes rates. Affordability is not the issue. The issue will be over the desirability of making big interest payments to bondholders. This is a particularly inefficient form of government spending. In the case of the U.S., half the bonds are held abroad, and most of the rest, most of the rest, are held by institutions. There isn't much uh, bang for the buck uh, that comes from spending on interest. Uh, well, there goes that was the interesting. Um, that was the interesting uh, article by L. Randall Wright. That's what I get from. I believe it was January 20th of uh, last year. Uh, I I um, study him. I study Warren Bozer. I study Stephanie Kelton. Um, if you are not familiar um, with my um, YouTube channel or with uh, my anchor, .fm, um, I had been reading from Stephanie Kelton's book, uh, Steps and Myth, which I finished. Uh, then I started reading uh, from uh, Warren Moser's, uh, I want to say, a Seven Deadly Innocent uh, uh, Policy for Us or something. In fact, I thought this might get that wrong. Anyway, the point being is the fact that if you want to know anything about uh, monetary system and you want to be able to come back to someone or, or at someone who likes to talk about the debt and all that stuff, Read up on monetary theory, watch it, study it, and you'll have. And just remember, anybody that wants to talk about a debt, um, the debt clock I just I, I just found out was originated by a person who had gone an interest-free Liberty Bond in New York. 
which meant they only they didn't have to pay interest on it. They just had to pay for a loan that came through. So they themselves actually, uh, um, uh, Robert Durst's father, was also a real estate mogul and did everything else and stuff like that. As far as real estate, I think it was pretty Donald Trump in that case, but whatever. Um, but the point being is. The one person or one of the people that claim that the U.S. has debt is another person who takes advantage of those tax savings that created the quote unquote national debt. The national debt is only money that has been spent inside into the economy without being taxed. That means that those taxes that haven't been taken out are the, is the same money that went to the billionaires and millionaires. The same people like um, Jeff Bezos like uh, Durst, like a Trump, pretty much like anybody that makes over a billion dollars a year, over a trillion dollars a year. That's, those are the same people that have actually created the debt uh, because of their taxes that they didn't pay, which, yeah, they have. Anyway, that is what you call the debt ceiling, that's what we call the debt problem, and them actually not paying their share of, of taxes. And therefore, they actually turn around and use that money to um, buy back their stock. Well, Fargo will be starting to uh, buy more and more loan stocks. Uh, if Morgan Chase, Chase, Chase has already done that. Every big bank that has done it in the past years are going to start doing it again, which means the, uh, the market will be artificially enhanced, like usual, as far as the part goes. And that's that and uh, Bitcoin will be one of the bigger bubbles we'll have in the future because you know when you artificially um, keep up, uh, up, up uh, keep something up, eventually that's going to burst, and a lot of people are going to hurt financially. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. And in this case, listening. Um, uh, let's see, this will go on my Patreon, so and it'll be free, but. What won't be free, <clears throat> excuse me, what won't be free is uh, my mom, the lot of months I go to and interviews I do conduct in the future. But thank you for listening and check out MFT, learn it. Um, and in turn, I'm pretty sure by that time, you know, after you hear more and more people like uh, like the, uh, like the uh, uh, L. Randall Ray and the Warren Moses and Stephen Kelton, you'll learn more about that and you'll have as many answers as you can get in here as far as learning. But thank you again for uh, listening. Uh, subscribe and become a patron. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, Instagram. Anyways, thanks for listening. Peace out for now.